Hello and welcome to Project Passion, the podcast made to inspire you to follow your passion and turn it into a successful business or career. My name is Johnny Thompson and this week I'm joined by podcaster, panellist and former gladiator Vogue, it is Susie Cox. How's it going Susie, you alright? Uh-huh, very good, very good, thanks for inviting me. No problem, thank you for being on the show. Um, as I tell everyone when they come on the show, I'm not the best at giving the introductions, so I usually just keep them to one or two lines, but do you want to take it away and just kind of take the stage, let people know who you are, what you do in your own words? Yeah, well, as you said, a hundred million gazillion years ago, a long time ago, probably before most of your listeners were even born, I was a gladiator. So not quite as far back as the Roman times, but almost, feels like it. Um, it was a huge 90s TV, cult TV, Saturday night show. Um, if you haven't seen it, Google it, because it's everywhere. Um, so that was, I, you know, prior to that, I was in international sports. So I'd done, you know, as a gymnast, and then went on to do something called competitive aerobics. Again, Google it, you'll have never seen it. Um, so that toured me all over the world, which was amazing. And then I got auditioned for Gladiators. So I did that for about five years. And then from that, obviously, lots of spin-offs from doing that, which is amazing. So we did Panto, which is really fun. Uh, and loads of other TV, radio. I had fitness DVDs, because I have a fitness background, qualifications. That's my sort of main prior life. Um, and then I met my husband on the show, uh, he was one of the contenders. So since then, obviously, we got married and we've had two kids who are now 13 and 15. So I stopped doing a lot of other work. I decided that was going to be my main focus and be, a, I call it a professional mum, because it is a full-time professional job. People say, I'm just a mum. I'm like, no, you're a professional mum. It takes all your time and energy. Um, and then since then, obviously along the way, doing a few odd things, but podcasting has been my sort of main go-to as well, because it's really good fun. And I love asking people questions. As you know, Jonathan, we started our chat and I was asking you all the questions. So I'm going to shut up and let you ask the question today. Um, yeah, so, t- so now my life is still being a professional mum, but podcasting, presenting, hosting, and just, yeah, meeting lots of new people, which is great. Awesome. Uh, so let's throw it back a little bit. As you said, you have been very active your whole life. I know you were quite athletic as a child um, and you've done obviously your qualifications in that. But what I wanted to ask you about was this competitive aerobics that you spoke about, because I did look at this before coming on here. And is it true you were the UK champion in 91, 92, 93 and 94? Yes. And um, yeah. And European champions in, I'm going to get it wrong now, 93, I think it is. It's so long ago, I can't remember. I think it was 93. Yeah. And seventh at the Worlds in Las Vegas as well, I believe. That's exactly it. So the last time we competed at World Championships, we did three World Championships, we were ranked seventh, which was pretty good going, considering most of the other countries had it as a, almost like a professional job. Our job was still within the fitness industry but we were sponsored by Reebok which was amazing um, to get to competitions and all our expenses etc and some kit um, but the rest of the time all our rehearsal time our coaching our, you know that wasn't paid for so yeah I was pretty proud of that actually to be seventh in the world that's awesome at, at the time you were doing that what were you actually working as what was paying the bills so to speak um, well still within the fitness industry so I was teaching group classes aerobics classes, uh, variations of the theme, um, and doing some personal training. That was primarily, uh, yeah, 99% of the time, and the rest of the time was training. So, yeah, so during my early, so I, I actually had, I was quite ahead of my years, I think. So I did A-levels, enjoyed them so much, I had to go back and retake them. <laughs> they were so much fun. I spent a lot of time. So I, I, you know, did professional sport, not professional sport. I did high level sport until I was about 15. And, and then I got glandular fever, which sort of really wiped me out. Yeah. Um, so I found it really hard to get back into, you know, high level training and competing. So, and then you hit 16, 17 and the clubbing years. Yep. Were you in? Which alcohol takes its toll. Well, yeah, not so much alcohol, actually. And a lot of my friends, yes, absolutely. But I think because I've been so... I, I just I used to drive everywhere, but my friends loved it uh, because I used to just drive them. I used to just like clubbing 
for the dancing because that was just in day, like 100%. I'd go to a club with my friends, they'd go off and do whatever they were going to do. You know, I'd go, right, I'd dance for like two and a half hours solid and then like, right, I'm going now. So I'd literally go and have a little sleep somewhere. I said, I'm leaving at four, we're leaving. But so consequently, my A-levels didn't really entice me quite as much as they probably should have. Um, I just found it all a bit dull, really, sitting around and sitting still in lessons, and it just wasn't active enough. And A levels are quite intense; you're doing like three subjects, so it's just. Anyway, I think that was just me at that time. And but it, what it did for me, I think, was great. It gave me like a reset button, so I got all that out of my system for a couple of years. You know, doing clubbing, not doing schoolwork, obviously sleeping, whatever. And then at eighteen, I whilst I was retaking. Uh, two of my A levels. I got my art one, which was good. Um, didn't take a lot of brain processing for that one. That was okay. Uh, and then, yeah. So during that, I actually went and qualified, which then led me on to all the other brilliant things that I've done. So actually, at the time, you know, it might seem like the worst thing to happen. All my friends left and went to uni. I was at home redoing two A levels, and uh, and actually, and then I, I did a one day a week college course, which was actually linked to a university, which was to do with exercise and health studies, and it was like a the qualification which covered all the fitness and all the personal training and everything for a year and on that course I met one of the girls who's doing the same thing who ended up be, I being in the aerobics team that she'd sort of she'd started doing a little bit of dabbling in that sort of sport and obviously having been an ex-gymnast myself and then um, brought me back in and sort of said right actually you could be really good at this we really need you in the team so I joined up uh, into her team and um, basically just end up you know, competing with her onwards for about four or five years. At 18, I was probably fairly mature, which is quite worrying because I'm not now. I think I've gone the other way now. But at 18, I had this sort of thought process in my head of, okay, I'll retake the A-levels. I got involved in doing the competitive sport, which was amazing. We did really well. And I had then I got offered a place to go and do um, sports science at a university. And I thought, do you know what, actually, I'm going to defer that because I need to do the physical stuff now while I'm still like 19, 18, 19. Um, and so I made that decision and I thought, actually, the brain stuff I can do, obviously, it's still physical, sports science, it's not like, but it is more sort of, you know, the learning bit I can do later, the physical stuff I need to do now while I'm in the zone. So I made that jump and actually it was probably the best thing I've ever done, you know, at that, that point. Um, because obviously from doing that, I did the competitive aerobics, which then led on to being spotted and in, invited to come and audition for Gladiators. I actually got asked to do it for the very first series, but um, we just qualified to go to Las Vegas for our first World Championships. And I thought, oh, you know, and I'd seen American Gladiators and I thought it was really cheesy and really awful. <laughs> I thought that's never gonna well but tv back then you know late 80s early 90s was really safe and sensible we weren't like that Woo! Yeah! you know like wwf hadn't arrived you know it was like old you know i'm talking a long time ago nearly 30 years well more years ago it was really different and then obviously it made a massive turn and gladiators came on and it was a massive hit um I'd still carried on competing, you know, Jet, who was one of the original girl gladiators, she was competing aerobics at the same time. She'd put me forward for the audition because they were looking for some other girls similar to her. And I said to her, look, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go to Las Vegas because who doesn't want to go to Las Vegas anyway? Um, yeah. And by then, all my friends who'd gone to university were doing exams. And I was like that, ah, off to Las Vegas. See you later. Yeah. You know, whereas when they first went, I was really jealous because obviously they were just in freshers week continuously for like months and I was just like that but so it worked out in my favor and actually I do not in like you know sort of you must do this type of thing but I do I have taught a lot of teenage girls in in schools and things and I do say something look really really if you can focus for that really short period of time don't do what I did but if you get an opportunity it's not the be all and end all to have to go to university and do a normal pattern of life you know, yes it's important if that is important to you but if it's something you just have that sixth sense is just not right for you, there are many, many other opportunities and, you know, ways to go than just that normal academic route. You know, I have different skills for different things. You know, I'm, I'm okay. I'm sort of middle of the road academically. I'm not a complete, you know, bottom of the pile, but I'm definitely not up there. 
Um, but I have a lot of other skills that I think that are much more, that you can't necessarily teach. And if you have those skills, people skills, communication skills are massively important. And that's something my husband and I both really home into our kids and try and encourage them to do. Because if you can speak and communicate with people, it helps you get on in life. You know, in whatever you want to take. You know, if you can, it doesn't mean you have to be in front of the camera presenting and being, you know, showbiz, showbiz all the time. But just being able to communicate with people on a level and different types of people is a really important thing. So that's what I'm questioning and I talk for a living. We, we might as well burst that bubble now. The elephant in the room, gladiators. Yes. So obviously you were on the show 95 to 2000. You played probably one of the most fan favourite characters on the show, Vogue. Uh, even I remember watching Vogue, and you might I actually am old enough to remember watching Gladiators as well. Because if you were on 95, 2000, I'd have been, you, you, yeah, you would have joined the year before I was born. So I was watching some reruns probably as well. But, um, but yeah, you're obviously a fan favorite. Um, and you also came back in 2009, I believe, for Legend Last Stand. We did, <clears throat> yes. Um, so Gladiators, yeah, it was amazing. I mean, you know. It, it, it was one of those massive, huge, iconic TV shows, which at the time, you know, was the prime time Saturday night viewing, you know, massive. whatever age, and it covered all the ages, like you say, it covered, you know, three year olds up to 93 year olds, and it was all that whole family, because there was something for everyone uh, on the show, and the kids loved it because they could shout at the TV and, you know, shout at Wolf, and it was like panto with, you know, sport, and glamour, and yeah, action film and everything. You know, all rolled into one. Um, so the Saturday night was Baywatch, Gladiators, Blind Date. That was your three massive shows on a Saturday night. That's it, that's all you needed. So the older, you know, the teens, the 20 year olds, my friends were all now telling me they were getting ready, you know, they were on their way out, they were getting ready to go out, or they're at uni, or, you know, going out for clubbing or whatever. So they'd be like around early Saturday night watching, getting ready, or eating, or whatever. And then you have all the families and the young kids who are at home and the grannies, everybody. So that was amazing, obviously. Um, and then, obviously, the sh I think because the show had been on, I joined it, obviously, three years in. So it had been on for, like, eight years. And it was such an expensive show to put on. You know I mean? You, know, you can imagine the production, the amount of people involved. It was huge. And it did have huge viewing figures. But by then, we are just starting to open up and uh, were things like Big Brother, where... TV production companies could earn gazillions by people phoning in and voting and just drawing in people, you know, in a completely different way to just, you know, audience and show. You know, people could participate almost from home in the show and say, have a say in who stayed and who went and all that type of proper gladiators. I still think they should do. And you still, you had a live audience as well, didn't you, for the shows? We did some early on, again, to... TV, TV shows, generally, the, the audience stuff is, is free. So they used to record all of the Gladiator shows in the summer holidays, so that all the kids could come. So it was two shows a day, so it was a long schedule. Yeah. Two shows a day, 7,000 people twice a day in that arena. Wow. Yeah, so massive. Wow. Massive. Um, <clears throat> so amazing, but quite... I mean, obviously, I'd competed and I'd performed in front of quite big crowds and, and audiences and things like that. But this was different because I was coming into it and I'd watched it. You know, I'd seen Diane, you know, Jet, and I knew, knew her. I didn't know anyone else. So when I was brought in as a new girl, like a new girl at school, and two or three of them had been asked to not be there anymore, it was really awkward, really awkward. It was like that, hi, luckily I knew Diane, otherwise I think they'd all been like, you know, who are you? Yeah, so it's proper, like, you know, ingratiating yourself into all these people that I'd watched on TV as well. You know, I didn't know them. Um, so, yeah, the first sort of few rehearsal shows and days, and Panther was my absolute bestie and still is. Um, she was amazing. She completely looked after me and uh, took me under her wing and mothered me, so, because I was like a new girl. Um, and we're still really good mates now, which is amazing. Um, but yeah, so the show, the show was obviously massive. And then after that, obviously it came to an end. It came to a natural end where obviously just TV, everything had changed and moved on. And this style of TV wasn't as, uh, I suppose, user-friendly. You know, for production companies, TV companies, it was just costing them millions. And okay, they might get it back in viewing figures and advertising and stuff, but it's still a huge amount of money. Uh, 
I think that's where the, where the term came. It came to a natural, I suppose, it's only been on for eight years, um, which was amazing. You know, the American gladiators hadn't lasted that long. Australian gladiators didn't last that long. Um, so, and it was a huge production. So it came to an end. And then South Africa, we went to, uh, we got asked by the South African production team. I think Hunter was involved with sort of negotiating all this. We took a few of us out there to do some shows in 2000. So just as our UK show had finished, we just went out there and recorded a series with them. Which was interesting. Uh, we... The Springbok was that? No, because they used to do those anyway in our series. So again, we do. I think it was fifteen domestic shows. They used to do like I don't know six internationals, and then we'd have kids shows as well. It was called Train to Win. So you'd be a team captain for two kids. So one younger, one slightly older. A lot more pressure. A lot more pressure doing it with the kids than doing our main show. Because I mean, I was quite lucky because I was quite a good. All rounder, I, you know, having been a gymnast, I could do the swinging high stuff, but I could also whack people. But I wasn't very, I'm not very tall, I'm only five foot six, I'm not very tall, so I'm actually quite short. So they'd only put me on jewel and things like that if it was a really tiny person, they wouldn't put me there who's like six foot two because it'd just be over. Because that's what I didn't know what what is the actual setup of the show itself? Because obviously, it's a competition for the people that come on, and you're obviously trying to stop them. Is was it a case of like, you know, t not take it easy, but was it a case of like, you can't just s smash everyone to pieces that comes through the building and like, or were people genuinely just good and actually just kind of got through, through that? Well, it's a, a, probably a combination of the two. I mean, there was no particular plan. I'm extremely competitive, so I'm not going to lose on purpose. This is not going to happen. You know, I can't, I'm in board games. Do not play games generally or, you know, table tennis. The kids are like, mum. Calm down, you know, basketball, anything. I'm like, ah, go to like crazy, aggressive mode. But there is an element of, at the end of the day, it is a TV show, it is an entertainment show. So to make it more interesting, for example, on the hang tough, on the rings, there's a few people that you just know, you've seen them do it, and you're like, they're literally just going to go like that and hang. They're not going to move. Boring TV, boring for me, boring for the audience, just boring. So, you know, you can elaborate, but I'm still going to pull her off. You know, that's just going to be given. So if people do win, definitely myself. But they did tend to pair people. So, for example, in the early shows, they would just put you on anything. We don't select what we go on. You know, there's no, you know, I'm only going to do that and that and that. You know, no. You get put on a show, you get a little piece of paper under your door. I mean, now it would all be digital, but back then in the 1800s, they put a piece of paper under your hotel room door, um, of the games the next day and you can sleep or not sleep depending on what the game is um so you get you know maybe two or three games a show you know rotated around and they put generally put you on everything by the time they get to the semi-finals and finals then they tend to put you on your ones that you may be better at or more do make it harder because the contestants are getting better and they're getting efficient so they want it to be a good battle um, but for example, if there is a really tiny contender, there's no point putting a really tall girl against it because it is over in seconds. You know, the ball is slightly more, I mean, it did even out a little bit early on. The boys were enormous, obviously, gladiators. Um, and it was about 90 kilos when he did the show. And he was fantastic. So he looked enormous compared to a lot of the male contenders. Um, you know, whereas. Some of the guys are really tiny. Whereas the girls, I'm five foot six. Some of the girls are bigger than me. You know, they're bigger than me. The girls. But you were particularly good at hang tough, from what I remember. I think from being a gymnast, you know, it's just a natural thing to to hang and swing, and just comfortable hanging and swinging. Whereas some of the other guys who have more body, but it's a lot more bodybuilder background, which is amazing, and they're really powerful and strong. But on the ground, you know, anything that involved going up and moving and agility was was terrifying for them you know, absolutely terrifying so the, the lot of gladiators still had to overcome you know fears i mean pole acts i remember there's a <clears throat> there's a spinning poles so these huge big cylindrical yeah poles and they've got little steps that jut out so you basically climb and round them step round and it's rotating as you do it you get to the top hit the button and then whoever's there first the other person's little steps just come in Onto an airbag. I got that on my very first filming show. And again, because I was using my brain beforehand, I saw the schedule. I, I'm a bit of a stato when it comes to working out and planning. 
And I was like, right, it's in, only in four shows, so you've got like that person, that person, they're really good, and the best of those three will probably do it in the final. I'm not going to get, I'm not going to get to see it. I loved it because I literally, but I'd only gone halfway up in practice. I've gone halfway up, jump, it's like jumping off into an airbag. It's like, what fun is this? It's brilliant. Stupid. Because I've gone, oh, she's enjoying it. Let's put her on it. First show. I did not sleep, I don't think. I was terrified absolutely terrified but it was real life you know it was a proper adrenaline it's the kind of show that every kid wanted to be on like i mean if you were to ask me what tv show out of every tv show in the world would i like to be on i'd probably say gladiators because it was just i mean it's probably a testament to why it lasted so long in britain as opposed to other countries is we just have an affinity for aggression and just battering each other in in the name in the name of sport yeah also had the humor i think the entertainment side of it so sorry you know our show was very much panto larger than life you know flip your hair around all that sort of you know cheesiness that you did back then uh, well you used to wing all the backflips coming in for your entry but you know characters, they were characters they, we, like it was like early spot you know suppose spice girls that's where the next sort of thing came it's like there's different characters and each, people are drawn to different personalities and different characters for different reasons so you had a cross section of us that became role models or you know whatever kids would just buy into some of us uh better than others and and again you know follow us around the country and come watch a panto and just and like i said because it it covered all the ages so the kids who were three are now 40. <laughs> no, no, they're not. the 10 year old boys who we used to meet on the show are now 40. so you're like you know they've grown up with it and they still love it you know because it luckily has been reshown and on various different channels well, what we're saying, so we, our show came to a natural end, obviously, but then they left it a while and then they relaunched a new show, Gladiators, on Sky. Um, and that's where we get to come back and be legends. Legends. Again. It's a really polite way of saying old people. <laughs> put, put the OGs of it. Uh, yeah, the original Gladiators. Exactly, our own gangsters, original Gladiators. Um, yeah, so my son, who's now 13, was, so it's a long time ago, so he was, he was just born. I literally just had it, but and they were ringing, and I was like, seriously, I've literally just given birth. And they were like, well, you can't do it anyway. I'm like, yeah, but I really want to do it. <laughs> They're like, you can't. Um, but they were going to test it out. So they did one se one show with some of our old guys in it. And it was, you know, it was hilarious because obviously we were just like, we didn't care. It was like panto. We were just like having fun. And a lot of us hadn't seen each other. It was a reunion. It was amazing. But they knew one. They took themselves a little bit too seriously. Amazing show and amazing athletes. But they were given a different sort of direction, I suppose, of how to be. And it was just a bit intense and a bit serious. And so when we all showed up, it was like, yeah, we were just having, you know, it was like panto. So it, it just did show the differences. And I, I just think because it was a much smaller scale, you know, audience, it was only like 200 people, it was in a different studio, they did a bit over water. I mean, they tried to make differences and it was, a, you know, it was a nice show, it was great at the time and, and really fun for us. Eventually I did get to go and do it. I think my son was then about nine months old or something, um, but they still wouldn't let me do some of the games. But I mean, half the kids, oh, half the kids, half the, you know, some of the girls who were on it who were gladiators, I was like, I could be your mum. Oh. You know? She was like, one of the girls was like 18 or something or 19. I was like, ah, and I'm one of the younger ones. So imagine yeah. one of the older ones. I was like, they're going to be your grandma. <laughs> <laughs> so it was fun. It was fun. And the fact to go back and be called a legend uh, was great. And Ian Wright was um, presenting it. Um, I think Kirsty Gallagher initially and then Carolyn um, Flack. Yeah. And we should go back and do it again. I don't know. I think I'd like to stand there with a microphone. Post it instead of. Yeah, it's nothing to do with not being in Lycra. I just, I just like to be on the other side of it now. Because, you know, having been there, I think it's a good thing to have someone who understands it and appreciates it. That's why Ian, Ian was good, and that's, you know, Fash was good, because they were sportsmen. They could appreciate, you know, the physicality of it. In a good way, in a good way. But, as I say, you moved on after that, and you've done a lot since you left Gladiators. Um, it's not the only thing you've done in your life. But what was the first movie for you after? Because I know from what I've looked up, you've done some modelling, you've presented The Fix, you inspired a video game heroine called Silver, which is probably the craziest thing. Uh, and then obviously your fitness videos and DVDs as well. Yes, videos being the operative word. That's how long ago they were. Um, yeah, I mean, I, the video, the fitness stuff obviously just continued through. So, you know, from being you know, a sports person, then into teaching, coaching, 
And then that's just always carried me through. Even when I had the kids, you know, it's something I could easily go and do. And I went in to teach and mentor sort of some teenage girls in schools around where I work and live. And um, that was challenging because they were sort of, you know, my daughter's age now, 14, 15, 16 year old girls, which, you know, can be depending on their personalities, quite challenging. But luckily, for, um, myself you know i had one one week one girl just them just dissed me you know gave me that that sass look she just stood her arms folded just doing like left and i was like does she know who she was tackling i don't know i was just like uh what are you doing said, you know that look that you're giving me i said i invented that look and it doesn't work on me so let's just move on like that i just walked off because she was just like that i think because i think because of the way i was with him you know they forget ages you know i'm much older than they thought I was. And that's not be, be me going, I look really young. It's just, you know, when you're 15, people who are 25 are old. You know, people who are like 35 are like, you can't even, you know, they're the parents, you know. So, bouncing around and being like crazy and doing some really cool dance stuff with them and, and chatting to them. I think they thought I was 30 something and I wasn't. I was still, I think I was at the time, I think on my birthday once I was doing some GCSE stuff with some of the kids there and one of the boys said oh is it your birthday miss i'm like yeah and he said how old are you like 34 i went yeah like 43 <laughs> he was like just turn around the other way i was like yeah yeah 34 yeah 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 so you know brilliant but that that that's the sort of thing i enjoyed doing it was quite rewarding it was challenging but rewarding um the fitness dvds and videos i did some of my own and then i went on and did some with um I did, oh, I had to choreograph, not choreograph, I had to present and be the fitness person for a guy who, was, who worked with Beyonce, one of her dancers or something. The worst thing ever. It was such a long production. He was brilliant, just couldn't present. You know, there's, there's being a dancer and then there's presenting and they're very different and you, it's not the same skill. You're good at one thing, not so great at the other thing. Um, I did one with a girl from Coronation Street years ago as well. Um, so yeah, it was great. So lots of different things coming about. And then, you know, with the kids, obviously I could still carry on doing some of the fitness stuff part time in between. So when they were at school, eventually I could go then and teach and just, just keep my hand in and feel like I was giving something back, I suppose, really for me of actually, you know, all the skills that I have up to now, um, acquired, um, using them in a, in a way that I feel, yeah, was a bit more rewarding. I was really mean, hard as well. Some of the kids were quite challenging. Um, because that was something else I was going to ask is, I assume there's, if not even just a network, but some skills and attributes you would have brought from uh, working on gladiators into your life afterwards and being able to sort of use them to your benefit. I threaten my children, mostly. No, just... um, no. <laughs> um, no because the, the, years ago, my kids were tiny as well on YouTube. The only YouTube clip of me on gladiators was me on Hang Tough where there was a girl um, who was a British tug of war champion. So she's really tall, really strong. And she couldn't do the swing, like as we talked about earlier, she couldn't swing on it, but she was just, she could just hold on for like mm -hmm. ever. So there's a video of me literally like pulling on her, pulling her hands. And then eventually that was the only person I didn't get off on hanged up, I think. Dropped onto the mat, so I don't want her landing on me. She fell down and then just lay there and she'd cracked two vertebrae in the back. Because obviously the way of me pulling, and then as she landed, just really big smack there, just That's... so cracked two vertebrae in the back. That was the only oh my... my kids saw of me doing gladiating. Just almost paralyzing someone just from yanking at their hip. That's yeah, so my kids used to go, "That's my mum." I'm like, "No, don't show people that because that I didn't mean to do it." She can let go. For goodness sake, yeah, I know. So luckily, there's a lot more variety of clips now. But was she all right? She was fine. She yeah. covered covered well enough to then madly she got because obviously she was out the show then understandably uh they invited her to come back and compete um when we went to south africa oh wow but she came out there all her family came pauline and she's a lovely girl i was like you're mad she we had i don't remember the game atmospheres so the big balls that we used to roll yeah. around hamsters in our show we had smoke that just went off on the pods so if you cover if you went over you know like a pirate you know not pirate but oh like, yeah dry ice sort of smoke um out in south africa they had pyro fire lovely no health and safety let's put it that way so we had to wear if you did that game you had to wear these like flame retardant sort of lycra oh, no. 
So Pauline did that, very strong, very good. And it was basically like knocking Skittles over. It was a very different setup. And she did that, fell over, someone went fire. They pressed the button, she was on the bottom. And even through the leggings or whatever we were wearing, she got like a huge, like second degree burn in the back of her leg. I assume this girl did not come back to Gladiators after that. You are not, but her whole family had come out to South Africa to watch her and everything. And I just like, uh... Some people are just built different. This game isn't for you, sorry. Well, I just, you know, it's just really unfortunate. Bless her. Obviously, so bad. Get her stuff back. Because she, she was a super amazing athlete, you know, and very strong and physical and it's just not meant to be. This woman is literally a tug of war champion and you broke her. <laughs> I didn't break her. I broke her by accident. But the second time was nothing to do with me. Um, but yeah, I just think, you know, I mean, for example, the very first show I think we recorded, we have an end of series party. And because I'd never really, you know, I hadn't done it before or anything, I got to the end and I was, all these people like coming in and crutches and wheelchair, you know, because it was brutal, you know, and it wasn't necessarily us injuring them, you know, it was just they landed awkwardly or... Yeah, catch a foot in the net and you'll break your ankle in no time. And the eliminator, which we weren't involved with, you know, that's just driving mad. People go, oh, so what's your favourite game? They go, the eliminator. I'm like, brilliant. I'm not in that bit. Thanks. The only bit I don't do... That's your favourite bit. It's your favourite yeah. bit. Thanks. Yeah. But that was a very exciting part of it, though. The Eliminator oh, was yeah. insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was literally the nail-biter finish, because it could, even if someone was, like, way ahead on points, it could still change. That would that would make or break the family that night, so it would have depended on who you were uh, sort of cheering on that night. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, and my, you know, saying my husband did it, and he'd actually, so he got to the quarterfinals. <clears throat> And then I think he did the gauntlet and Warrior sat on him at the end because he used to be a rugby player and a decathlete. So he was quite good at you know, getting round Devin. and also being about six foot ish. Six foot three. He was bigger than most of the contenders that the boys were used to have, you know, going against. Yeah. I think because he got near to the end, Warrior just sat on him and then they sort of squared up to each other a bit. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> but it all ended well. It all ended well. But he didn't win, did he? He got the best prize. He got me. Oh, well, I was going to say there, was that, I probably don't want to talk about it, was that during the show or after the show that you would have met him first? I met him during film during filming his show. <clears throat> um, but weirdly, so so what happens, I remember the show originally, they, um, as they're introducing each contender on the show, they've got a little bit of footage of them at home or doing their job or, you know, that sort of interview with each contender to know them before they are introduced into the show more little you know clips that come on through their show um and there's one particular cameraman who used to go and do those so that particular year I, every year like, like i said to you i like to know stuff like to plan out so i was like right dave who who do you think is good this year who do you think um and so he started describing all the contenders uh you know girls obviously and then some of the boys and he started describing what were, is now my husband and i was like oh that's quite i'm single at the time uh I was like, oh, sounds quite nice. Um, and then weirdly, we'd all go out in between. So it, the first sort of two weeks is is um, training. We have three days training, and then we do camera rehearsal for a week, which is the most boring thing for us. Ever. Brilliant for the, all the crew and everybody else, but we don't do anything. We just have to sit in the arena for like hours on end, waiting because we don't go up on the games. You know, they don't like us to go up on the games. You know, we have to look and pretend we're paying attention where the camera's going to be but someone tells you that anyway so we don't need to be there um anyway so during that period of time it's all a bit slightly more downtime i suppose for us before it really kicks in with the schedule so there's a little bar club whatever next to the hotel where we're staying at so we'd all go in there and a lot of the contenders were in there this particular night and this person was standing up at the bar and that was my husband and i was like oh it's nice. and jenny rebel knew him vaguely through athletics because she was an athlete very good Commonwealth Olympic athlete <clears throat> um, and so she trained with him at a similar sort of time, a similar sort of age. Um, so she's not, oh, I know him, anyway, it was like being back at school. I have talked about this before, so it's not a new story, but um, I have to say something, you know, I quite like him. So she went up to him, like you were when you were like 14, 13, 14, you know, you've got a girlfriend. I was like, uh, yeah. Do you love her? <laughs> it was literally like that. Oh my God, I it was almost as bad as that. I was just like, oh. And then it spreads like wildfire through from the director 
down to everybody, all the crew, every single person knew. I hadn't even spoken to him at this point. I've not even spoken to him myself at this point. It was more time. So anytime we were sort of vague, you know, vicinity together, they'd be like, all the others, it's him, it's him, it's him, it's him, it's him. him. I'm like, yes, I know. This is really embarrassing. Can you see? <laughs> I don't even know what he's like. He might be awful. I quite like the look of him. Um, and eventually we did have a conversation and eventually we did drive that away from everybody and actually, you know, have a coffee and just go, hello, as two normal people, as Susanna Mark rather than Craig and Contender, because it was very much them and us. Uh, <clears throat> very much, even, you know, Contenders and then there's us. So there was, I felt like I was sort of, you know, defecting to the other side, if you like. For a bit so we just got to know each other that obviously he had a girlfriend so that had to be dealt with um, but what was really embarrassing was eventually when his show did get screened it was about three months later and obviously we were together then he wasn't with her but she's on the show obviously in the audience because that's what they you know mark's mom mark's girlfriend mark's this. But, and i'd only known most of his really good friends who you know we're still really good friends with now for about three weeks or something we're all sitting there watching his shows oh no it's fine it was 20 nearly 25 years later i think we're okay yeah. i would think so after that long 23 years sorry i'm jumping ahead 23 years Maybe 24. Okay. you're just excited for the next two to come that's why exactly that's it. and since then you've also had your podcast uh podcasts actually with the s um first brief pants with vogue and the viking podcast uh, is that one still going on or hiatus? It's still, it's still out. It's still, you know, launched. And you can listen to it by all means. We haven't continued that again. Like yourself, you know, you were talking earlier. You know, I obviously done bits and bobs, and we we sort of done the brave pants thing. It was it was a really fun thing to do, and again, it was really easy-ish thing to do, and it was more of a right. We've got this bit of time. It's something we're both really passionate about. Women specifically, just going and doing stuff they've always wanted to do, and not being afraid to go and do it. So it's that whole idea of you put your brave pants on, and just go and do it. Whether you want to learn to sing, you want to be a forest, you know, you want to jump off a bungee jump, whatever it might be. It doesn't have to be crazy, but it's something you've always wanted to do, not people are forcing you to do. But you've just always gone, oh, I don't know. I can or I'm too scared or I'm too this I'm too old too fat too thin whatever you're because I can't do we were like yes you can just do it um so that really came about so we interviewed some amazing female guests who've either done massive life changes or gone out and put their brave pants on and gone and done something so that was really fun and then uh then lockdown basically the you know the pandemic hit we were just starting to go and do some events we were being booked for like international women's day last year to go and do some seminars and webinars and workshops about being brave and you know because that's something that i love to do i love live events i love standing in front of people you know i've got used to this but i much prefer being in front of people in a real crowd and getting that banter and interaction um one-on-one -on -one it's fine but if you're in a group um presentation it's really flat you know because people can't all talk at once they can't you know on a zoom or whatever it might be it's just not the same um, so we just started to get booked for a few of those and obviously then pandemic and, and lockdown. Um, and then Anna, who I was seeing at the Vikings, she, we've called her Vikings, she's not gladiator, but she's just very tall and Swedish. And we'd known each other about 10 years ago and reconnected. She just moved back again to London and she kept calling me Vogue the whole time. We went for a bike ride and I was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What's wrong with you? You know, I was like, right, I'm going to come up with a name for you. And I, you know, Ice Queen and various other things because she's really tall, really tall and very blonde, very pale. I was like, right, Viking. That's it, Vogue and the Viking. Brilliant. And then, then we went, right, we need to do something with this. This is just such a cool name. That's how it came about. We literally went and we're like, Brave Pants. You know, we tried, we had this sort of long winded description of what we wanted it to be about, but we needed something short. We're like, Brave Pants. That's it. Um, so we've done quite a few. I think that's about 18. So each week we'd have a guest, every other week we'd have a guest. And then in between weeks would just be us downloading, talking shit about something that happened that week or what was in the news or something that was annoying us or whatever. Um, just a quick 15 minute one. And then, so that happened. And then Anna has very much younger kids than me. And I think, you know, homeschooling is oh, hell. Uh, I'm minor teens, so they're pretty self-sufficient, but you still have to be on call a lot. And the stress or, you know, technical issues or something, or you've got to do a DT thing. You've got to find 15 cardboard boxes in like two seconds, you know, that you haven't prepared. 
so there is that but with younger ones it's very full-on and I and she really struggled to um, get her head around doing anything else around that and a few other bits of work that she's doing so it's not completely shut down but it's just put on hold for now and then like you I just went right at the end of 2019 I went, yeah brilliant this is it 2020 is the year I'm gonna put myself back out there do some presenting and events and da -da -da. I was getting really excited you know, like eh. Pandemic down, no entertainment industry, no live events, no nothing that I love to do. So I was like, right, okay. So luckily I started working with a few uh, people who've been helping, which was great. I you know, invested time and money into myself, which I haven't done for a very long time, uh, most of last year, which was great. So I worked with them like a mindset. So the person uh, called Liz Ward, who's got a company called Slip Pivot, and she pivots basically. So I sort of went to her and I said, look, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've done, this, I've done all this stuff. I don't know what to do with it. What can I do? Put it all together and make it make sense to do something. Uh, and there's a pandemic and there's a lockdown. And so my big, big, big idea, and I still really will hope it happens one day, is to have a huge live event, which incorporates all the things that I love. So, you know, food, you know, people have to eat, but that's not one of my huge passions. Uh, but more sort of fitness, fashion, food and fun. So it ends the whole day is like, lots of cool stuff it's like a festival Cirque du Soleil and ends with amazing DJ set for about awesome. three hours I cannot wait so sign me up head. take my money still in my head it's still there I'm gonna have plans all over my walls ready to go but obviously I started planning that spending about two months early on in lockdown I was like this is I just probably uncomfortable doing this now because I can't even research I can't even go to other events I can't look at venues I can't do anything so that's on hold till further notice you know next year hopefully or even the year after <clears throat> so in the meantime it was trying to find stuff that i could do that worked towards that but also you know put me back out there a little bit and presenting world and hosting i mean my ideal love like i said to you earlier is, is a microphone i love live audience i love i'd like to be a host compare that's my main goal in life is to be booked to be you know a host of compare i've done lots of it in the past um, but put me in the microphone. I talk to anyone. I don't care who they are. And for anyone, what is, anyone that doesn't know, and I'll pretend I know, what does that mean? What being a host or compare? Host, or, com, com, what compare? Host, compare. So the person who is standing on stage with a microphone who introduces the guest. Oh. So if you have a big corporate event or uh, you know you have a, you have you know guest speakers will come up. I would be the person introducing them and like you do on your podcast. Oh, introducing so host just then yeah host. you're just you're just send the fancy posh way off but there's host or some people prefer to use the word compare you know compare. so you have to compare and you know I don't know uh, uh, anywhere you know like a I suppose a, a, a what they call them um master of ceremonies you know a wedding and the person who introduces everybody to come in or whatever it might be person with oh. a mic does all the talking basically. I'm at the Northern Irish Public School we don't know them words so... well, I don't either no I'm just being to a few things like that the person who stands up and introduces everybody does everybody just shut up and listen that's me basically that's it I'm very good at that I'm very good at that and that's what I want to do and I love it and I don't care who the audience are whether all male all female mixed corporate I've done so many different events you know in my gladiator sort of persona and not and along the way and worked for big corporations, um, financial corporations. So that's that's what my, I found out during this year really is, is what I actually really love to do. Um, so along the way, I've used that and, and devised this Bring the Energy Workshop, which is about that. It's about people not being put off sitting looking at their screens on Zoom or if they're trying to do an interview for a job or they're trying to, they're on a big Zoom, you know, webinar, but they want to be seen. And I'm not talking about, you know, dance around the background naked scene wouldn't advise that but just just almost like what i'm doing now i'm do, i said i do my like panto reactions if i'm on a screen because that is my personality anyway but if you're on a screen of like 20 30 people and you're all tiny little square like that they can't see you going oh they can't see you doing that you have to go right like, you know big gestures make it yeah energetic be seen and, and it's really good for the person who is presenting because they're then getting that feedback if you were in a room with them they'd feel that it'd be a much more subtle version you wouldn't have to go every five minutes because they just see you go oh you know or clap or whatever it might be but if you're on mute 
and you're on a big screen and there's 20 other people, you know, give them, give the person who's speaking that sort of feedback of how you're feeling. Um, and just being seen and lighting yourself properly and, you know, sound and everything like that so you can be seen and heard. And, and just enjoy the process. You know, we've got to flip and do it for probably a while yet. So enjoy the Zoom screen presenting. Is there any other advice you could give for someone that maybe isn't as confident, even through Zoom? For obviously, you know, as you said, audio, good lighting, you know, be more energetic. But is there any sort of key things to keep in mind for people that maybe are a bit nervous going on then? Well, I would say well, I mean, there's ways to do it. So it depends what you're doing. If you're just going to be sitting listening to someone, but it's having that, you know, that if it's someone who's going to ask questions and pick on people or get say, right, everybody do a 30 second. Hi, tell you about yourself. That is terrifying to anyone, you know, to go, oh, I've got to talk about myself. Oh, my God. Uh. So have a little plan, you know, almost like a set script that you use. Have your little elevator pitch. Maybe they'll have three things about yourself. You know, hi, I'm Susie. I used to be a gladiator and I've met the queen. Done. You know what I mean? It's sort of, or I love dogs or whatever it might be. And also I say have something behind you that is appropriate, obviously. <laughs> but shows your personality so whether you're I don't know, a star wars geek or you love harry potter hufflepuff yeah, exactly. so that's what i mean so it's a conversation piece. so if someone goes oh, what's that on that what's that cushion what's that you know that back, what is that point whatever it might be it, it's interaction so someone go why have you got a microphone behind you oh that's because i do a podcast um, you know or whatever it might be it, so not it's not just you on the screen people are looking what's behind you they're not just looking face even if you are a small little square they will still don't have your dirty washing hanging behind you don't have inappropriate things did you see that girl's welsh news i think it was who had a is she the one that had the sexual cup or something hanging up yeah sort of strange off there massive inappropriate thing you know if she was talking about sexual health or you know sex that's fine it's appropriate because that's what you're being asked about but you're not so yes. what was she talking about did they say what she was actually talking about unemployment i was like we're not gonna get employed unless you get rid of that really i mean i'm all about being yourself. i'm all about being yourself showing a true personality but the sort of pitch it to who you're talking to you yeah know, it's, it's not about being totally like laid back or if you're you know if you are trying to get a job, if you're in an interview, be engaged, be interested, have interesting stuff about yourself on post-it notes at the side, because in that moment of nerves and panic, you will forget, you know, have them stuck on a wall in front of you, whatever it is, just little cues, little reminders. So if someone says to me, right, tell me three things people may not know about you, tell me, you know, they will put you on the spot with those questions. So rather than going, uh, panic, have, you know, it doesn't matter really what it is. It's just about you showing outside of your work CV other things that you do. And I think that is also important for people. So don't be afraid to be yourself, but pitch it right to your audience. That's what I say. And also, you know, get with confidence thing. I think also get yourself in the zone. So if you are going for a job, you know, whatever gets you in the zone, whether it's like relaxing music beforehand, like full trance house, whatever it is that is your thing, you know, rock out beforehand. So you get it all out your system and then you go, oh, okay, hi. That's it. You know, that is what I would suggest. It's like getting ready for a sports event. For me, it's like, it's the same thing. It's preparing for a competition or whatever it is. You get everything ready. You get your kit ready. You get your tech ready or not, as the case may be. <laughs> um, as much as possible to be ready. So then you haven't got all those other distractions going on and you can just focus on what you've got to say. Because I think my most awkward bit doing podcasts is, and people that watch won't even notice this because they only see the zoomed in on who's talking bit, but when other people are talking, obviously guests have a lot bigger segments than me. And I just usually sit here going, because I don't know what else to do. I'm like, I, I'm like, if I smile, they're going to think I'm really weird because I shouldn't be smiling. But I just, like, I'm engaged. That's why I just, I focus in. No, and I end up just staring at the camera, going. And then yeah, I'm I, like, this guest must think I'm way weird, way weird. Yeah, yeah, because if you look at, if you watch any TV interview, especially if it's pre-recorded, so they'll have, you know, especially if it's like two people talking, you'll have the guest and you'll have the interviewer, and you'll have the the shot of the guest saying what they're saying, and then you always have the shot of the interview going. 
I've done it a million times. I'm like, this is ridiculous. This is so not what I'd be doing if they were speaking to me. But they do that quick shot of you going, oh, hmm, that's really interesting. No idea what you're talking about. And no one's sitting there. I'm not listening to anyone, but I'm just going to nod as though I'm really interested in what you say. You are generally watching someone speak, so it's completely different. Yeah, but that's my biggest thing. And I know some people as well. I know a lot of podcasters who actually don't like talking, which is a really weird thing when I've talked to them about it. And yeah, yeah, I had a conversation with a podcast. I'll not say, but I had a conversation with a podcaster who enjoys interviewing people, but in like short form questions. So like he'll literally give them like the tiny snippet and then just have them elaborate pretty much on the entire thing. Because he doesn't like talking, but he likes hosting the podcast. So I mean, that, that to me is more a written interview, isn't it? Yeah, you know, pretty much. Send them ten questions. They write back the replies in between. You know, if if it's audio, then I think I think there is a balance. There's a massive balance. I am prone to talking a lot, as you can probably tell. So when I'm interviewing people, I have to occasionally go right. Shut up. Listen, it's, it's about them. It's not. It's not that I'm about me. I'm just. I've got so many questions I want to ask. So many things I want to say. They're relevant. To what they're saying, and I get too excited. So I have to like. And occasionally that goes the other way too. Sometimes I'm saying, God, I didn't say, I didn't ask them that. I forgot, I, you know, because I'm letting them speak. Because generally, if you listen to podcasts, you are interested in the guest because, you know, the, the tone of and the style of the podcast and what the topic is about. But generally, you are interested in listening to the guest. But there's also those questions that you at home want to ask that you want them to ask yeah, as the interview. So you've got to get that. It's, it's hard because, yeah. I'm prone to talking a lot. Yeah. Well, I mean, for you, it's probably a bit different for you than me because obviously you've had what a lot of people would call success and what you've done in your life. You've met quite a lot of probably high profile people in your lifetime. Whereas that's pretty probably second nature to you now. For me, it's still like that little giddy bit of excitement. Like like when I knew I was going to come on and speak to Vogue from Gladiators, I was like, I, like I was like a boy again, a little child again. Yeah, but I think everybody's excited. And I get that with everyone. <laughs> I'm excited. I like being like, because I'm normally asking the questions and I have to stop myself doing that. I get excited whatever interview, whoever I'm speaking to, I get excited and I get a little bit nervous. It's good to have that little bit of nerve because then you're like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting. If I was just bored, rigid, just going, God, I don't do that. You know, I, that's why I like seeing people and speaking to them. When I record my podcast, I don't see them and I find that really hard. So we don't do it visually. It's completely an audio track at the moment. We Right, which is why, you know, the Brave Pants one was great. We would either, the guests would come to us or we would go to them. And we'd all sit around a table and it'd just be mental. And there'd be a lot of editing <laughs> because of three people who wanted to talk all at the same time and be excited. Um, but I much prefer seeing people. I think being able to see someone is much more engaging. And like you said, you know, lots of people will watch the YouTube interviews and video interviews as well as just listen to the audio. I suppose it depends where you are and what, what you can do. You can't obviously sit at your desk at work just watching a video, but you can listen to an audio. Um, but I, it just brings it to life. For me, I like much more three-dimensional world. You know, I like real people, meeting real people in the real room, and this is the next best thing, seeing people just talking. I know I've just done a lot, of, quite a lot of voiceover work as well, and that's really quite tricky. It's, it's harder than you think to do and pitch correctly because obviously on the on the podcast it all has to be like it's what we talked earlier about you know you have to be excited and have a little bit more interest in your voice and sound like an advert when you're doing the intros and outros whereas this one for this pitch in the pilot company had to be much more and i was doing it at the same time as i was doing a lot of the intros and outros for my podcast so i had to keep thinking right okay special head voice for the kitchen stuff and woo how does that work for voiceover then? Because if it, for a kitchen advert, is it literally just a roll and advert of the like B-roll and then you're talking over it? This was um, an original, the video they already had, and it was an American script and voice, and they wanted to make it more for European market, so they changed the script slightly, but um, it was hard because we were trying to fit the original i transcribed the original uh, script and then they de-americanized it if that is such a word but you know what i mean um and then we had to try and fit that script to the original video which was i didn't do that bit because that is not my expertise of any technical which is why i'm so excited about what you do because i couldn't do that at all so actually you know i can talk and if someone sends me the link and i plug my microphone in normally it works 
um, and I can do that bit. Um, so we were trying to, and it's trying this timing and pitch and making the words. And some of the words I've never even heard of. I mean, it's quite a high tech kitchen appliances. I don't really, I do cook, but like, you know, I'm not a chef or ever will be or ever want to be. So a lot of this stuff was like, it's completely wasted on me. I don't know what half these terms are. You know, it was like, you cook, you boil, you grill, stick it in the oven. Yeah. What more do you need to know? You don't need to know your glassware and stemware for the dishwasher. Glasses. Glasses, glasses, surely. You know, so I was, you know, so a lot of it's quite, it's quite tricky trying to get that exactly right and fit it. So I'm just waiting for them to, okay, well, we've done it all and sent it in. But it's quite, it was 11 scripts, so 11 different appliances. Each one had a different script. A lot of it doubled over and, and repeated, but again, each one had to be. And there's certain words I just realised I could not say in a sentence without <laughs> sounding like I'm slurring or I couldn't pronounce a thing. So it, it's harder than it appears. Than it appears. And you also have your new podcast that recently just released, Top Dogs. Yes. Wait, let me get it right. Top Dogs and Their Humans. Perfect. Yes, very excited. So that came about again through the whole pandemic lockdown uh, era it was meant to launch before christmas um but due to various lockdowns and people involved it got a bit delayed which was fine um i was putting lots of pressure on myself to get it out there and i was like why am i doing that i've commissioned this no one else has commissioned it i've commissioned this but why am i setting these stupid deadlines <clears throat> so we've got six guests it's all recorded it's all ready to go the first one was launched last wednesday uh, so that was Karen Hauer, who's in Strictly, um, and she's got, it's all about basically human connection through dogs. It's a, I, my, my idea in my head was like desert island discs, but with dogs, not discs. So sort of getting to know people, going behind the scenes a bit into their life, because people who have dogs talk about themselves through their dogs. So you meet someone walking in the park with a dog, I have two dogs, you see, I have two rescues, and you chat to someone, you don't you chat to the dogs and you talk about the dogs, but you end up finding about their life because you talk about the dogs they don't say oh hi i'm so and so and i haven't left the house for like three weeks they will tell you that about the dogs you know um so that was the idea to get more high profile people on not necessarily having to talk about themselves with those direct piers morgan style interviews but you find out where they grew up and how long they've had dogs their love of dogs you know people in their life who come in and you know, all that sort of stuff but hopefully um yeah hopefully it's going to do well so the second episode went out today and that's with DJ Nikki Beatnik, who's amazing. She's worked with every single celebrity that you can think of on the planet, I feel. Um, so she's amazing. So her one's gone out today. Um, and then there's four more to go. Finishing with a gladiator, funny enough. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm launching at the moment. So please, anyone, go and listen to it. I'll talk about your podcast if you talk about mine. Uh, yeah, reviews help, don't they? I mean, reviews help just just get more people to see you and hear you and this people be able to find it so if anybody does review yours i will do yours obviously um yeah amazing so yeah that's exciting because i love dogs and i love talking to people so i was like got to put those two together and something else i just wanted to ask kind of to sort of round it off a little bit because when it comes to podcasts i know it's kind of a big debate for a lot of podcasters about research now i know podcasters should do zero research and jump on and just kind of free ball it me I am a massive stickler, like you said, like I have my notebook and I have to scrupulously just write exactly what I want to get out of that because I, especially with a lot of my uh, guests where I've got like marketing guests on and very entrepreneurial business based and for them we're just trying to drive as much value in terms of advice and stuff. So I'm very scrupulous in that, all right, I want to get this, this, this and this and you can divert whatever way you want around that but we're going to hit these points on the way through. but. How do you obviously research? Because yours would obviously be very different, I assume, going in because it's more dog based than human based. Well, it is complicated. Obviously, it helps. I have researched the guests that I wanted to get on. I've pretty much got on for this first series. I've been really lucky. I mean, and Karen was incredible as well. She's very high profile. She was in Strictly at the time. And that's partly why it was delayed a bit because she was involved with Strictly. And I really wanted to have her on as the first guess not there's any particular order but i just think the order that we we haven't rec put them out the order we recorded them um i just want to do them all and then go well oh, that works put them out in that order. um just again there's a little bit of variety and and what i think are the most fun episodes someone else will think no i really like that person or you know again like we talked about 
the, what I like and what other people like are very different. And that's great. So we're trying to have, so we've got two male guests, we've got four female guests. Every loves their dogs. And that was the, the bottom line. Every, you know, it was about dogs primarily, but interesting stories behind those dogs with the people. Um, so for me, yeah, I, I researched, I mean, I probably researched them as far as just having, I have a, a set format of the type of thing I want to say, a bit like yourself, probably, you know, maybe like five key things and finishing with a generic thing that I asked them all, you know, if they were a dog, what dog would they be and why? Just like you say, just that conclusion end. So it's the same because people sort of look forward to that. People get in a pattern listening. I know I do with certain podcasts. I like to know that, that what's that finishing line. It's like, and in other news type of thing on the news, there's always some finishing yeah. <clears throat> question, generic, that's the same for everybody. Um, because the stories throughout will be very different. So it's quite nice to have that sort of repetition at the end. Um, but as far as researching them, I like, again, just having a bit of an outline, but I don't know everything. And so a bit like you just go with the flow a little bit. I prepare, but I also go with the flow because they might just start talking about some story that I've never heard of or don't know about them. And it's amazing. And you're like, you've just got to go with it. So um, I think just for me, just remembering what you want to talk about, you know, for me, it's the human connection about the dogs, but I also want to hear funny stories. You know, I don't want it to be all doom and gloom about rescuing dogs and, you know, poor dogs who've been treated like, you know, there's an element of that. And each guest gets to talk about a charity of their choice as well. So that was really important to me. So each podcast episode, there's a mention or a website link. And for the launch last Wednesday, we just did again, because a lot of people got so much going on. I mean, I don't want to put any pressure on people, but it was a donate and dog walk. So it was literally take your dog for a walk like you normally do. And, you know, please donate the cost of a coffee for yourself and a friend, fiver, if you can. And lots of people did lots more than that. We raised like, you know, just under, well, I suppose just under over a week, a um, thousand pounds, which was brilliant. Wow, congratulations. So that's for the Wild at Heart Foundation who, you know, rescue dogs all over the world. So for me, that was a key one. And two of the guests, that's one of the charities they support. So we went with that one. So that was the idea. It's just trying to, you know, there's, there's always, for me, it's always a give back. I really like that sort of feel good factor. I like to give back and I'm really bad, really bad at getting, asking for money for things. I hate that. I'm really uncomfortable. I'm really, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm financially driven. We talked about this. But I'm really uncomfortable. I think it's probably because in a, you know my past life I had a manager and an agent and all these people done that for you. That for you. So I, I don't even like it. I don't even like when I just teach classes. I was like just put. I don't want to don't see. I don't want to see the money. I don't even look at it. You know, and it's not because I don't want money. Of course I do want money. Everyone wants money. I'm just really uncomfortable. I'm not good, and that's something I need to get better at. I need to get better at just going right. This is the fee. And this is it. I would so, do everything for free otherwise. <laughs> and. <laughs> My kids would be very hungry. <laughs> Not good. No. So that's something I would say I need to get better at. You know, that's one of my things to work on. Right. And like you said about rounding up, how we round up here is just asking where can people find you? If people want to come watch your podcast, they want to come find you. Your social media handle will have already been on the screen, but for anyone else, links will be in the description, but where can they come find you? Um, well, there's two ways, obviously, Instagram, at Susie Cox Live, and at Top Dogs and the Humans. That's the two main ones I use now. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Susie Cox, and also um, a website is in motion. It's been a long process because, totally down to me, because I'm just rubbish at passing on the information to the very good people who are making it for me, who are lovely. Um, but susiecox.com will be live very soon, and that will be a central hub with all the stuff so stuff about gladiators stuff about podcasting events everything should be in one that's the idea is to have everything in one place but linkedin i pretty much i do myself so lots of stuff that i'm doing is always on there if not on instagram i'm on twitter as well but very rarely i think it's cox one susie there we go <laughs> well same as always guys you know links will be in the description below please go across check out susie check out her podcast go and have a look um, I know she'll definitely appreciate it. And as she says, leave reviews. Reviews are key for what we do. We really do appreciate them. And that's it, guys. Yeah. I obviously want to say again to you, Susie, thank you very much for coming on. I do appreciate you taking the time out of your day to speak with me. Great. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. And hopefully we can catch up again at some point in the future as well. See how your podcast has been getting on coming through this year. Yeah.
Exactly. We can all put ourselves forward for podcast awards. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, that did it for this week, guys. Please remember, if you are watching the YouTube version, go down, hit like, and hit subscribe if you have enjoyed the content. If you are listening to the audio version, you can go across, follow the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you are, and you can also leave a review. Uh, the review link is also at my link tree if you want to get the quickest and easiest way. Hit that, and you can go on to my rate my podcast, leave a review, and it kind of correlates them all together for me. It's a little bit easier to look at. But yeah, that's it for this week, guys, and we'll be back again next week. We'll have another incredible guest on talking about their life, their motivation in their story and until then i'll see you later hello guys how you doing it's me jack mate you've just finished watching probably one of the best videos on youtube so why not take a moment to consider subscribing and if you haven't already hit the like button and turn the notification bell on apparently it helps i don't know how it was a good one though wasn't it